We are together in God's global mission to reach everyone, everywhere. As we experience Christ, embrace community, and engage globally, we are made one. In Jesus' name, we praise, pray, learn, and serve. Together, we are peoples. Hello, church. Our names are Paul and Michelle, and we serve with One Mission Society in Asia, where God originally called us to use our professions as veterinarian and nurse to share the love of God with the people of Asia. Currently, our home base is in Seoul, Korea, and we serve as regional directors for One Mission Society, where we have ministry and missionaries in 15 countries in Asia. We are so excited to be a partner with you in the gospel of the People's Church. As we start our worship today, let's read Psalm 67, three and four. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. Let us read that again in Mandarin. Shana yuan wanning changzani. Yuan wanning do changzani. Yuan wang guo do kuai le huan hu. Yin wei ni bi an gong zheng shen tan wanning, yin dao shi shang de wang guo. So let us worship the God who gives us so many reasons to praise his name. Good morning, People's Church family. It is great to see you all here on this beautiful long weekend as we come and center our hearts on God. Will you please stand and say hello to one of your neighbors, give them a handshake, high five, fist bump, a wave, whatever you're comfortable with.
again, let's continue to worship our God as we stand amazed in his presence.
stand in your presence because of who you are, because you have first loved us. And Father, because you have first loved us, we accepted you and you have given us this great commission to love others as you have loved us. And Father God, we pray that our eyes and our hearts will be opened as we walk into our daily lives, as we walk into Missions Conference. Father, may you press upon us your desires for us. May you open our lives to you, that we may know who you have called us to, where you have called us to, who you want us to walk next to, who you need us to love, to be your light to. Lord God, we praise you that we can worship you so openly. We love you, Father. We give our lives as offerings to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church, it's been wonderful to worship with you. Will you please be seated? Amen. Well, good morning. Thank you, Christy and the worship team for uh, reminding us of the importance of worshiping the Lord. Today is a good day. This is the day that the Lord has made, and it's my joy to welcome you. If you're joining us online, welcome. You can put in the chat that you're new. And if it's your first time here at the People's Church, we would like to get to know you. So at the end of the service, we would invite you to meet us in the Connection Center. When you exit to the left, you'll find the Connection Center there. There's a team that is waiting to answer any question you may have. And if you have been attending here for a while and you wonder how to serve, feel free to make your way there after the service. Well, last week, we uh, prayed and commissioned our West Wing, and there's a lot going on with our children and our junior youth. We actually are planning, July is going to be a very busy month. We're planning a vacation Bible school uh, for children under the age of 12. We also have our junior youth who are going to be involved as missionaries through our premix, and that's July 17 to, I think, 14 to 17, around that time. Um, so we all pray that God would touch them and that our junior youth would get to experience the Lord. And now we're giving them the opportunity to learn how to be missionaries in their own cities. And we are inviting families who have junior youth to encourage them to participate because that's a good practical experience. How many people know it's hard to take junior youth overseas right away, right? So we're just trying to start them in Toronto. And we are a global church, so we want our junior youth to be globally engaged. And if you're saying, I don't have any junior youth, but I would love to sponsor a young person to participate, maybe the Lord will lay it on your heart this morning. Uh, and that's what we give. We give so that we can have the gospel being preached throughout the city, but also through missionaries, through our partners, through our youth, and that's what we use resources for. So as we give, remember, giving is an act of worship, but it's also an opportunity to send someone. It's uh, sowing a seed into the lives of someone so that they can actually go and sow a seed in the life of another person. So let's pray as we bring our, our tithes and offering to the Lord. You know how to give. If you're a regular member here, you can give online. You can give by texting GIVE to the church phone number at 416-222-3341. And if you brought your offering with you, you can drop it in the offering box as you leave the building. It's straight there. Somebody asked me at the end of the service a few weeks ago, where is that offering box that everybody's referring to? As you exit, there are black boxes on each side of the doors. You can put your envelope there, and, uh, and uh, I know some of you are using checks in your giving. So let's pray as we lift up our gift to the Lord. I know some of you are giving throughout the week, so, but giving is an act of worship. So lift up our offering to the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are a good God. It is indeed you, God, who give us the power to, to get wealth so that your kingdom can be established. And we pray as you are, have blessed your people, as you're giving us, we're giving it back to you. And the scriptures say, as we give, it should be given back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So we thank you that we're giving out of our abundance so that this gospel of the kingdom can be preached. We thank you, Father God, that you bless your people with jobs, 
with investments, with resources, and we're able to support the work of the ministry. We pray for those who may not have. We have our youth maybe who want to participate in pre-mix and the, the parents may not have employment. We thank you, God, that you are Jehovah Jireh. You are the provider. And we pray that you will provide. We pray that you will provide jobs. You will provide opportunities. That you will bless your people so that we can be vessels for you to flow through, Father. We thank you that you will multiply the seed that we're sowing, that you will give leaders wisdom on how to be good steward of these resources. And Father God, as we pray for our TPC family, we also pray for families in our communities who may be struggling uh, post-pandemic. We thank you, Father God, that you see you are the God who provide bread. We thank you, Father God, for those who may be homeless, Father, that you will provide a roof on the earth for them, Father. And that if it's even working through us, through our church, that we'll be able to bless them. Father, we thank you. May we always be reminded of God that we are the body of Christ. So we are the hands that are sowing and we are the feet that are going. So Father, we pray that your glory will be manifested in this house, in this church, but also in our partners' ministries and around the world. Bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So let's have our junior youth stand and uh, join with uh, Pastor D and the team and continue their worship in the West Wing. And if you happen to be a junior youth in the building and you sit with your family, you can meet the team in the, in the lobby of the church or make your way to the West Wing. And we're going to welcome Pastor Brett, who has a word for us today. Thank you, Solange. Thank you, Christy and worship team for leading us so well. Well, if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to take a break from Matthew for a moment because we are heading into an important season in the life of the People's Church. For the past 95 years, we have set aside time every year to devote our attention to what God is doing globally through our Global Missions Conference. That's because missions is at the heart of our church. It's part of our founding vision. Oswald Smith felt a compelling call onto the mission field, but for a number of reasons wasn't permitted to go, so he was used by God to raise up a church that was passionate about global mission and had a global vision. And so if you call the People's Church home, this is an important next few weeks for you. Because what happens every year is, yes, we give our collective attention to what's happening in the world, but God also lays his unique calling into individuals' lives each year as we move through conference. He's got a purpose or a plan for you to play in his global mission and oftentimes that emerges over the next few weeks. And as Solange just prayed, it's also a time of year where we discern as individuals what God would have us contribute to global missions in the coming year through our faith promise giving. This is actually a, an act of radical generosity where we go against the tide of our Western culture of excess Choose to live simply so that we can live generously and contribute to what our brothers and sisters are doing around the world. And so over the next few weeks, you'll be invited to pray to God about that and determine what he would have you give as well. But a number of months ago, as a leadership, we came together to pray and seek God on what we should be focusing on in this year's conference and we were led to a passage in Ephesians that is profound in its implications, but also informs how we are to step into a global mission landscape. Paul's writing to a group of church churches in the region of Ephesus, and he pens the following words in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, we read this, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. 
There are many churches in the world, but only one body. There are, in fact, many denominations throughout the world, but only one spirit. What the scriptures are declaring to us is that while we may travel throughout the world and on the surface of things experience difference when we encounter the different cultural expressions of Christian community, the truth of the matter is we are one body. And that one body is animated and brought to life by one spirit, and that one spirit calls all of humanity to only one hope, and that one hope is found in one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all, through all, and in all. So while we might see denominational differences, the scriptures declare that there is still only one body of Christ. So if you are a Baptist and the other person is an Anglican, if you both call Jesus Lord and have put your faith in him and are filled with the Spirit, you are of the same family. If you are Pentecostal and the other brother is brethren, but you both call Jesus Lord and have placed your faith in him and are filled with the Spirit, you are united in your common hope and you are one body. Let me bring it even closer to home. If you are a Toronto Maple Leafs fan <laughs> and the other person is a Florida Panthers fan, but you both have placed your faith in Christ, as hard as it is, you have more in common than you do difference. There is only one body. There is only one God and Father. And while the children may identify themselves by self-created names that outline their theological differences on a number of topics, it doesn't change the fact that the Father is over all, through all, and in all. Paul pens one of the most profound truths in all of Scripture. One that for generations has been challenged and at times compromised, but stands true regardless of our fragility or willingness to live into it. Now, this statement actually stands between two important aspects of Paul's letter to the church. He spends the first three chapters helping the church understand God's activity in the world, and then in the last three chapters, talks about the church's activity in the world. And this statement stands at the heart of those two realities. The first three chapters are all about God's activity. Paul reminds the church that God has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. He reminds the church that in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He goes on to tell the church that because of God's great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even while we were dead in our sins and transgressions. And Paul says, whether you were close to God or far from him, you both have been given access through the one person, Jesus Christ. And Paul tells us in chapter three that God's intention in all of this was that his manifold wisdom might be revealed through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Paul spends three chapters talking about the beauty and the wonder of the gospel, and then he's brought to his knees. Paul's writing from a prison in Rome, and on his knees at the end of chapter three, he prays and Praise that the church would understand all this and grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and that they would come to know this love that surpasses knowing, surpasses knowledge, that they may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Paul's telling us that God's love is beyond knowledge. It is beyond our intellect, and yet it can be grasped by divine revelation. 
And so Paul ends chapter 3 on his knees praying from a prison, and then he turns his attention in chapter 4 away from God's activity and the beauty of the gospel into how we should live our lives in light of that beauty. The second half of the letter is all about how the work of Christ on the cross should permeate every aspect of our daily lives changing how we see the world and how we serve and love one another. So if chapters 1 through 3 are all about the call into Christianity and into Christ, chapters 4 through 6 are all about walking into that calling. And in 4 verse 1, Paul says this, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Now, we may hear that sentence and feel weighed down by it. To live a life worthy of the calling we have received automatically oftentimes makes you feel unworthy and as though you have to measure up to something that seems impossible. But you have to remember, Paul's writing after three chapters of describing the beauty and the wonder of what God has invited us into in Christ reminding us that we don't do this alone. It's not something we do for Christ, it's something we do in Christ, carried along by the one spirit that's at work within us. So what Paul's actually stating is, walk a new walk. Live into the reality of this new life that you have already been brought into. Be passionate for what the spirit has birthed within you. Paul's call to walk worthy flows out of chapters 1 through 3. Now, that Greek word for worthy is the Greek word axios. It means appropriately. But it's derived from another Greek word that also could be described as befitting or suitable to. So Paul is saying, walk in a way that fits the calling that you have received. Worthy isn't about measuring up, but fitting into what you have been created for, what you have been welcomed into. And Paul talks in verses 2 and 3 about our disposition as we walk into this. He says, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So to walk worthy or fitting into what we have been grafted into is to walk in unity, to be humble and gentle, patient and loving, persevering in the unity of the one spirit. And Paul's saying, remember that in fact you are one body. You have been united in your common calling. So what Paul is actually talking about is oneness. That's a state of being joined as one thing and no longer separate. The fact of being one single thing. Now, you have to realize this was revolutionary in the time of the New Testament. The church in Ephesus was actually at the cutting edge of God's activity of making all of humanity one in Christ. The church in Ephesus was composed of many groups, many tribes, Many cultures, it was at the intersection of many nations' highways, and it was a blend of people. And it was composed of Jewish believers and Gentile believers. And prior to their entering into Christ, these groups were at odds with one another. There was division and name-calling and categorizing between these groups, The Jewish people referred to Gentiles as uncircumcised, outside the covenants, and foreigners to the promises of God. But Paul helps the church understand that through Christ, what was formerly separated and divided has been brought together and united. The church is a demonstration of God's activity of tearing down division of, and hatred, of reconciling humanity, not just to himself, but also towards one another. 
that results in a beautiful unity and harmony. The church is meant to be a visible demonstration of the wisdom of God. And our unity is that demonstration of wisdom. Grow into that which is a right fit for you. Grow into oneness. Now, Paul acknowledges that this is a process in our lives. In verses 7 through 12, he tells us that the gifts of the Spirit have been given to the church to help her grow and mature into him who is the head of the church. So Paul's acknowledging that we go through stages. When we're newborns, infants in Christ, we're kind of stumbling our way through in unity and love towards one another. But as we move through childhood and adolescence into an adulthood, there should be a growing maturity within the body of Christ. Amen? If that were only true in our lives, we should be growing in love towards one another the longer we journey with Christ. There should be a meekness, a humility, a gentleness in our disposition towards one another. Because love, unity, and humility are the indicators of maturity. The whole orientation of the body is to grow into him who is the head of the church, Jesus Christ. The church is meant to be a prophetic demonstration to the world around it of what life looks like when the head of humanity is back on. You see, the problem with the world is that the world is running around with no head on. Can I get an amen? (laughs) The whole cosmos demonstrates chaos because it is trying to function apart from its creator. I don't have to demonstrate how difficult it would be to navigate life with my head off, do I? I mean, that would be a pretty awkward demonstration on platform here. You wouldn't get very far without your head. And yet, the world is running around without its head on. Some of the wives in the room might be thinking, amen. My husband's doing that all the time. That's why we see so much hurt and pain and chaos in the world. And the church is meant to be a visible demonstration of what life can look like when the head is back on humanity. Paul talks about this in verse 16. Look at what he says. From him, he's saying from Christ, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Paul's saying from him, in union with him, directed by him, if you call yourself a believer, if you are filled with that one spirit, he has deposited gifts within you and you have a key part to play in the growth and maturity of the body. But it is in submission to his direction. You have been grafted into a living organism. You have been given connective tissue to help the body mature and grow. And so the church is to speak the truth in love and to mature people into him who is the head, Jesus Christ. And globally, the church's mission is to help people find that head again. But that body of work, because it's global in nature, cannot be done by any one church or denomination It is done by a global body of Christ. And we have to remember that it is his global mission that we step into. It is him directing how we step into that space. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul actually takes a deep dive into this whole idea of one body. And he's actually talking about spiritual gifts in the church, and he's describing to the church how the body cannot function in isolation It has to function in dependence upon the different gifts within the body, the different members within the body. Paul says, the eye cannot say to the ear, because you're not an eye, you don't belong to me. Where would the sense of hearing be? When you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and actually apply that globally, what you begin to realize is that scripture is saying to us, the Canadian church cannot say to the American church, because you are not Canadian, You don't belong to me. 
the North American church cannot say to the South American church, because you are not North American, you don't belong to me. Governments can do that. Governments can establish borders, but the body of Christ has no borders. It is borderless. Amen? The African church cannot say to the Asian church, because you're not African, you don't belong to me. And the Asian church cannot say to the European church, because you're not Asian, you don't belong to me. We are one body in Christ. We have many cultures, but one Lord. We have many perspectives, but one spirit. We have many differences, but we have all been baptized into the same Christ. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12 goes on to help us understand that when one part of the body rejoices, every part rejoices with it. If you rejoice, I rejoice. If you experience joy and celebrate, I experience joy. And celebrate, but it goes on to help us understand that when one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If you suffer, I suffer. If you get hurt, I get hurt. If you die, I die. And here at People's Church, we take that seriously. That's why, as a church body, We pray annually for the persecuted church because we know that we are one body. And when we see our brothers and sisters locked up in prison or suffering persecution and harm, because when one part suffers, every part suffers with it, we join them in our prayers and support during that difficult season. That's why we serve alongside the Colombian church as it welcomes refugees from Venezuela Because when one part's suffering, every part's to suffer with it. That's why we're engaged in advocating for refugees globally because of displacement due to wars, famine, plague. When one part suffers, every part suffers with it. What Paul is saying to the church is be zealous for the unity that already exists. It's not something you have to muster up. It's already accomplished. Live into the oneness that he has brought you into. Live in a manner that fits the call. Be passionate for what the Spirit has birthed. Now, many of you know I was recently in India, and sorry that I keep talking about it every week, but it was a profound experience, as you can see. And we have so much to learn from the global church. I had an amazing experience in India seeing the truth and reality of this verse lived out in a leprosy colony. It was a colony where people had been shunned, discarded, pushed aside, outcast. God raised up a pastor within that community to care for those who were suffering, to rejoice along those who were rejoicing, but to lift up those who were downcast. And I got to be honest, as we spent some time with them sharing a meal, distributing goods to those who were in need, it was profound to see the body of Christ building itself up in love as each member does its work. And it was a community that bore the obvious scars of leprosy. People were missing parts of their body. It was a crippling reality in their life. And yet, the beauty, the wonder The fullness of God's wide, deep, high love permeating through this community was palpable. As you were among them, I was jealous. I was like, wow, this has to be the most loving, interconnected, amazing body I've seen in a long time. Just the way they treated one another, carried one another, shared in a common suffering together, yet the beauty and the light of the Lord shone through it. And it bore a witness to the neighborhood around it. You can feel the love in that neighborhood. You see, Scripture calls us to a real oneness. Not a fake, false one that the world talks about, but one that suffers alongside one another. And as we grow into the fullness of his love, we display the wisdom of who he is to the world around us. As we look at this passage, 
in Ephesians and the truth and reality of our interconnectedness, it shapes how we step into global mission. So as we step into the next few weeks, I just want to get real practical as to how this informs our posture. When we join our brothers and sisters around the world in mission, we recognize that we're joining family. It's our own body that we're working alongside. And we enter into that partnership with humility. And there's a few guiding principles that inform how we step into this space that I just want to share with you. These are in our Global Mission Guidebook, but it's just to help demonstrate how this verse plays out into our global mission posture. We read this, the Great Commission must always be fulfilled and communicated in the context of the Great Commandment to love as Christ loved us. Jesus, with his disciples, right before he goes to the cross, says to them, love one another as I have loved you. That is how the world will know that you are really my disciples. So before we step into any co-creation of mission together, we do it in a posture of humility and love towards one another. It continues, all divisions, preferences, or demands for cultural uniformity deny the reconciling work of Christ and his desire to make us one in our beautiful diversity. This is something that Paul had to wrestle with all the time in the early church. He had to face it in Ephesus, Galatians, Corinthians, every book virtually that he wrote. Because Judaizers would come in behind him and say, in order for Gentiles to really be acceptable before God, they would need to culturally adapt to more Jewish-centered theology so that God might accept them. Therefore, they can't eat bacon. Thank goodness that was overturned. (laughs) They have to be circumcised. Thank goodness that was overturned. And a number of other conditions, right? And Paul was always in sharp opposition because what he recognized was Christ reconciles people through his finished work, and then Christ's spirit shines through the beautiful diversity of every tribe, nation, people, and language. So therefore, when we are doing cross-cultural ministry, we're not calling people to uniformity. We're calling people to unity, recognizing that it shines through our diversity. And it continues. The paradigm and language of mission is helpful in that it is purposeful and active. It calls us to do something, but that same language becomes unhelpful when it has any nuance of conquest, coercion, or agenda. We saw that most profoundly and acutely during the time of colonization, where mission was wed to empire and conquest, and we're still living with the legacies and danger of that taking place. So we step into a place very carefully, not trying to coerce, not trying conquest, but stepping in with humility. Love one another. Our engagement in mission must always be relational rather than transactional or utilitarian. Partnerships have inherent value. We're not just trying to get things done together. We're about building relationship because the body of Christ is a living organism building itself up in love. So as we enter into partnerships, we do so informed by some of this guidance. Now, the guidebook goes on, but I think you get the picture. What Ephesians chapter 4 tells us and informs is how we step into this space. Now, we can look over church history and see in different seasons how far The church strayed from this calling at different times. And there's much that we can learn from history. But unfortunately, we can't change what lies behind us, but humbly simply grow into that which lays ahead of us. And scripture calls us to something beautiful. So in the midst of a world that is deeply divided, we are called to grow into him who is the head, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way, and to build others up in his love. From a prison cell in Rome, Paul is led by the Spirit to pen a profound truth. The manifold wisdom of God demonstrated to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. 
And that call is just as clear to us today in our generation. So over the next few weeks, as we step into conference, you're going to hear about the oneness that God wants to cultivate in the global body of Christ. You're going to hear stories, testimonies, ways that you can get engaged. But to kick off conference, we're going to step into this space the way Paul did in chapter 3. Remember, before Paul talked about the oneness that we have in Christ, he was on his knees praying and worshiping God for how wide and deep and high and vast God's love is. And so this Friday, we're going to kick off conference with worship. We're going to start on our knees because we recognize that global mission starts with worship. It starts with prayer where we're listening to what God wants to do, not running ahead of him. And so we're going to begin in that posture. But over the coming few weeks, there is going to be ample opportunities for you to get informed and inspired and, and find your way into his global mission. But I'll say this at the front end of it. You will get out of this conference what you put into it. So put yourself in a position to hear from God, to hear his voice, to understand what he wants to do through you, the part that you play in all of this. Because this isn't for others out there. This is for you. He has a part for you to play. But as we engage with different content and material and experiences over the next few weeks, I also want you to realize this. These opportunities and gatherings are a means to an end. They're not the end themselves. The Sundays, the runs, the prayer walks, the workshops, they're all full of good content. But they equally lead us into relationship with one another and with our global partners. You can get to know other parts of the body of Christ who are doing amazing work globally as you engage. Because we have to remember the body is a living organism, joined and held together by loving relationships. And so as you engage in these opportunities, see them as a means to stepping into relationship with one another. Put yourself in a position for relationship because that is how he matures us and grows us. Amen? That's why we always say, together in God's global mission. So I'm going to direct your attention to the screen at this time, and this is what's happening this week for all of us to enter into. But again, you will get out of it what you put into it, so put yourself in that posture and position to hear from God. Take a look at the screen and let's hear what's happening this week. Hello church, I'm Fiona. This Friday night, we're kicking off our 2023 Global Mission Conference with a worship night, uniting our entire church family as we pray and sing, preparing our hearts and minds to discern God's invitation to His global mission. Today is the last chance to register for Living on Mission. On June 4th, this afternoon session will explore unique ways to embrace community as we eat, worship, and then actively listen and learn from each other and God. We also encourage you to register for Walk, Run, and Roll, a fun-filled interactive 5K where we'll have the opportunity to learn from and support refugees. And next Sunday, Dr. David Mensah will be sharing God's word and inspiring us but don't just take my word for it. Here's Dr. Mensa. I'm looking forward to being part of the Global Missions Conference this year because we've got challenges facing us, challenges that is making us to pit apart in, as a church. And then we don't know even how to handle the world, how they can follow us to see exactly what it is to live together in peace, to live together as uh, human beings created by God. It's not enough to just tolerate one another. It's not enough for us to just join the world's language. But we have something better we want to show the world. We have been told by Christ how to go about peacemaking and how to be one. I want to challenge you to come for this conference because there's, there's a lot the church can do. The church should be the pace setter. The church should be the place where the world can come and see what really brings peace, what really 
disintegrate hatred and racism. My name is Dr. David Mensa. I come from Ghana, West Africa. God has given me a ministry, a, a, a really prolific ministry, ministry to bring people together, ministry for people, even warlords, to come together who hated themselves to come together to be one. It is this peace work that I'm very interested in, in talking in the global conference. I'm inviting you to come for this conference and hear more. Wow, conference is going to be so good. For all the details, visit thepeopleschurch.ca. See you on Friday. That's right, Fiona. How many of you will be here on Friday? Yeah? Okay, I'll be looking for you here on Friday, and if you're joining us online, you're more than happy to, you're more than welcome to join us. Um, this is the opportunity, this is a great opportunity, and thank you, Pastor Brett, for the reminder, the fact that the theme of the conference is oneness. We are one, one body, one spirit, one hope, one God one faith, one baptism, and God is the Father of all. Some of you, you already know the Lord, and take the time uh, during that week to really say, God, where do I fit in the body? Some of you know exactly where you fit, you're involved in ministry. Others, you're like, yeah, I've been here for a while, I don't know. As Pastor Brett says, you will get what you put into the conference. So if you take the time to say, I want to hear about your oneness, I want to hear how, how I can be more connected to the body. And some of you may actually be sitting here saying, I don't even sure I'm a Christian. So you have the opportunity, you can stay in your seat or you can go to the Connection Center, talk to one of our, our prayer team members and say, I want to know this God that everyone is talking about. You can do that today and be part of the family. And if you're joining us online and you're requesting prayer, you can click the request prayer button online and uh, one of our online prayer team members will pray with you. And if you're here, as you know, you can stay in your seat and somebody will pray with you. And some of you may actually receive the call to ministry this conference week. I know that it happens every year. So take that time seriously and, and focus on asking the Lord how he wants you to get involved. Amen. And if you want to socialize and greet one another, it's a beautiful day today. You can do that on the lawn because we want to keep this space or to be a space of prayer. Whether it's prayer because you're hurting, you need someone to pray with you. Whether you need to accept Christ into your heart, whatever you need healing, you can stay and we will pray with you. Before I let you go, can we stand? I want to bless you with a word from the Apostle Paul out of uh, Acts 1.8. And Acts 13, 4. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be Christ's witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. God has made you a light to the Gentiles. That you may bring salvation to Toronto, Ontario, Canada and to the end of the earth. That's the word of the Lord. Acts 13 47. So I encourage you to go and to be the light and be here this Friday to pray with us. And uh, you should have received this card with all the details. God bless you. Have a great day.